Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to Word Pictures. We're glad you've joined us this, today. We're just about to the end of our study through the Bible. We're in the last two chapters of Revelation, Revelation 21 and 22. Please open your Bibles with us and we'll read from Revelation 21, the first four verses, talking about new heaven and the new earth. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth disappeared and the sea vanished. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready like a bride dressed to meet her husband. I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne. Now God's home is with people. He will live with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and he will be their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. Sounds like a wonderful time. Ken? <laughs> Absolutely. That's what we've been waiting for, right? All the way through scripture. So, <clears throat> What is implied when we say there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth? Does that mean God's going to completely get rid of our sun and our entire solar system and our planet here and start all over? I'm going to say no. <laughs> okay. Well, look at some verses in the Bible that might give us a hint. Isaiah 66, verse 17, for example, says, The Lord says, I am making a new heaven, new earth and new heavens. The events of the past will be completely forgotten the events of the past will be completely forgotten. So is that implying that what will be new is new events, new kinds of living? Well, look at Isaiah 66 now, verses 22 and 23, just as the new heaven and the new earth will endure by my power, so your descendants and your name will endure. On every new moon festival and every Sabbath, people of every nation will come to worship me here in Jerusalem, says the Lord. So now we've got a conflict of ideas, destruction or enduring. And more than that, where does the Sabbath come from? I mean, how do we know when the Sabbath begins and how do we know when the Sabbath ends? By the sun. The rotation of the earth. The rotation of the earth around the sun, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's the rotation of the earth that produces a day, but that day also changes as the earth rotates around the sun. So if God gets rid of the sun and our earth, <clears throat> He's either going to have to put another one back just like this one, or there's not going to be a Sabbath, right? At or least it'll some be other different. Way of keeping time. Yeah. So, <clears throat> if the Sabbath is going to endure, what's the implications of that? Well, it's interesting to notice that at the beginning of the, or at the end of the first creation week, what was celebrated? Sabbath. The Sabbath. A day of rest. God, not that was God was tired, he was taking a break from what he had been doing. So, Sabbath there, if the Sabbath is going to be a part of the new creation at the third coming, is it possible that God is going to recreate something like what he did in the beginning? Because we know from Revelation 12 that Satan was cast down to what? To this earth. To this earth before God created anything here. Or I shouldn't say before God created, before he created a world out of this earth. Being, the earth being the ball of mud and rock and molten core, and the world being the, the cosmos, as we call it. The, the, you know, cosmetologists do what? They pretty up the outside, right? So God 
cosmetically fixed our, wor our Earth to become a world. So you're saying Satan was cast down here before there were trees and Anything flowers and animals and, of course, humans. And some, some scholars, having read this, suggested that one of the reasons why Satan was cast down here, or maybe chose to come here, he knew that God was planning to do something here, and God might have said to him, okay, if you think you're a creator, go ahead. There's our earth for you. It's a perfect place for people to live. See what you can do. And he couldn't do anything. And God says, well, okay, watch me. See what I can do. And we have a Garden of Eden. Uh, you know, this thought's never really occurred to me before, Ken. Um, but, you know, the book of Revelation uses a lot of uh, symbols. Mm -hmm. It talks about different animals and different colored horses, and they aren't real tangible horses. They, they symbolize something else. How do we know here, then it talks about a new heaven and a new earth, that these are, are real tangible things, that these aren't aren't symbols. It talks about the sea disappearing and, you know, we, we, we often interpret in, in Revelation that when it talks about waters, it's really talking about large groups of people and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. How do, how do we know, how, how can we feel safe interpreting this as, as literal heaven and a literal earth and a literal sea when there's so yeah. much of the symbology in, in well. <clears throat> One reason for, for doing that would be the earth and the sun we have now are very literal. If you're going to have a new earth and a new heaven, does it mean we, I mean, doesn't that imply that it's going to be a new one, something after the order of this one? If you make something completely different, you wouldn't call it a new heaven and a new earth. You'd call it something completely new, right? Something different. Maybe a Saturn or a mm. Jupiter or a who knows what. So I, at least that would be part of the idea. Um, but I think you need to remember your question because we're going to come to some points that will help to make that very clear, I think, as we move along. How does 2 Peter 3, 10 to 12 fit in? That, in my Good News Bible, says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise, the heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed, and the earth with everything in it will vanish. So is God going to say, yeah, I'm going to completely destroy the heaven and the earth, but I'm going to put a new one back there that's maybe a better quality or something, looks the same, spins the same, same orientation? Now, he said on that day when he comes, mm -hmm. um, you just told us last week that this Satan, or last time, that Satan is going to be on the earth for a thousand years. Yeah. So um, how does that jive? Well... I guess the, the right thing to do would be to go back to Second Peter 3. And if you go just before the place where we read there, it says um, in verse... Uh, where is this? So it says a thousand years are like a day to God. So maybe they are like a day to God. On that day? Mm -hmm. So on a thousand... That would be within the thousand years. Mm -hmm. It's on that day. That's verse eight. So you still have verse to eight. It is Second Peter three verse eight. Yeah, and my good news Bible says, well, but do not forget one thing, my dear friends. There is no difference in the Lord's sight between one day and a thousand years. To him, the two are the same. So is so that a if you got one day equals a year, you also have one day equals a thousand years. Mm -hmm. So you've got both those principles. Well, let's, let's move on to, to, to see some more things that fit into this picture. If we read Revelation 21 and 22 carefully, what is it specifically that will disappear and be no more? Let's death. mention some... Hmm? Is one, death yeah. is one thing that won't be anymore. No more sea. No more sea. No more death. And, well, no more sea, that would be Revelation 21.1. Death will be no more, Revelation 21.4. Mourning will be no more, Revelation 21.4. Crying will be no more, the same verse. Pain will be no more, Revelation 21.4. All things cursed will be no more, Revelation 22.3. Night will be no more, Revelation 22.5 and 21.25. Those are just some of the things. Some of those things are back from Genesis 1. Yeah. Where, where God, first of all, he's, uh, 
light, and then he, and then he separated the waters. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be able to water, there's something none of us can really control. They should put it into a pipe. Mm -hmm. And of course, he even spoke there when he was on the uh, Sea of Galilee and told it to calm down. So, uh, yeah. but here, no more so, sea. Certainly, this picture would be a, a, a you know an attractive thing for us if all those things are gone, um, but it's fa it's fair really to say what did sea, for example, mean to John in his day? What 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 was implied by sea in his day? People. Well, that's one of the symbols that's found in the Book of Revelation, chapter seventeen. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the overall understanding of those days. Because the sea seemed to be always churned up and, you know, waves and all this kind of stuff. And so many people who tried to go out on the sea died. The sea was thought of as a, a symbol of chaos, uh, some kind of an abyss. They thought that they were down at the bottom of the sea there somewhere there was a, the abyss. It, Leviathan. And it's suggested in some places that it refers to the cosmic conflict. <clears throat> it was a symbol of deliverance. In some respects, think about the Exodus. When they finally crossed the Red Sea and the Egyptian army was gone, they celebrated, okay? Well, to John on the Isle of Patmos, mm -hmm. it could have been an obstacle or a yep. barrier mm -hmm. or uh, something yep. keeping him from his loved ones mm -hmm. or what he might have yep. thought was his mission. Yep. But isn't the sea okay if it's calm? Well, that's the problem because you... In ancient times, you didn't seem to have any way of knowing. Well, it seems like one minute is calm and the next minute is doing all sorts of crazy things. It's unpredictable. So, well, so you get rid of the whole sea because of that? Well, I mean, what if the yeah. next world, the sea is calm all the time? Well, it's like little, the sea of glass is the a calm. Line. Yeah, maybe that's the whole point. The what? Maybe that's the bottom line. If it's calm, it'll be there. If it's, it'll be, it's called a sea of glass, remember? Yeah. And today we even say that if, the, if, if you go out on water and, and, and people, for, particularly if they're water skiing or something, say, look at that lake, it's just like glass, let's go, you know? So you're saying that a rough sea is going to be taken away? That's a possibility. Though, okay. Another place in Revelation 17, 1 and 5, it suggests that the sea represents enemy peoples. And... In, in Revelation 18, it implies that it's a, the sea sort of implies trade and exploitation. So, so if, if we're using the term sea here in a figurative sense rather than a literal mm -hmm. sense, what are we going to do with death? How are we going to... That's not a literal. I was hoping that death literally would be taken yes. away instead of exactly. now we've got some figurative application here. We're going well, to, how do you figuratize <coughs> death? Well, you can figuratize the sea, but that, you can't. That, that was kind of my question there. How are you going <laughs> to figuratize? <or> some, <laughs> well, <laughs> it talks a lot about things that are going to happen to the sea and throughout the book of Revelation. For example, in Revelation 16, 6 through 16, a lot of the final plagues involve the sea. Chapter 17, verses 13 and 14. Chapter 19, 11 to 21. We obviously don't have time to read all these. Chapter 27 to 30. But think about this. If the sea were to die, as suggested in several of those places, if everything in the sea were to die, how long would we survive? Not very long. Not Why? the way the earth is created right now. Uh, I think I've heard the statistics that 70% of our oxygen is created by the, plant li by the animal life in the, in the ocean. The plant life. Go back the to oxygen. The oxygen. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, the figure I heard was 80%. Okay. Some... We wouldn't survive very long without the we would, we, we plants would, in the sea. Yeah, we would smother. We would suff suffocate. We would have lots of carbon dioxide and not much oxygen. So that's going to disappear. Well, that's what the book of Revelation says. Now, right. again, if we're, going to, if we're going to interpret this very literally, then we've got that problem to deal with. If we're going to say maybe something's being symbolized here... Um, I mean, is there something wrong with the ball of rock and molten core? Is, it, is that evil? I mean, you know, God, when God created this world on this ball of mud and, or rock and molten core, he said it was very good back in the beginning. 
so after he created. After he created. So is the, does he really need to get rid of it? Well, there are some very interesting places in the Old Testament that look at this. Look at Isaiah 65, 25. Wolves and lambs will eat together. Lions will eat straw as cattle do, and snakes will no longer be dangerous. Um, on Zion, my sacred hill, there will be nothing harmful or evil. In the more traditional text, it says uh, snakes will eat dust. And the, the, the verse which all, many parts of the, this kind of, of uh, tr uh, picture of the world to come comes from is especially in, in Isaiah 11. And look at Isaiah 11. I'm going to read those first ten verses quickly here. The royal line of David is like a tree that has been cut down. And what happened to the David's line for a period of time? They Gone. There were no kings. So a new king will arise from among David's descendants. And who was that? Jesus. Jesus Christ. The Spirit of the Lord will give him wisdom and the knowledge and skill to rule his people. He will know the Lord's will and honor him and find pleasure in obeying him. He will not judge by appearance or hearsay. He will judge the poor fairly and defend the rights of the helpless. At his command, the people will be punished and evil persons will die. He will rule his people with justice and integrity. Wolves and sheep will live together in peace, and leopards will lie down with young goats. Calves and lion cubs will feed together, and little children will take care of them. Cows and bears will eat together, and their calves and cubs will lie down in peace. Lions will eat straw as cattle do. Even a baby will not be harmed if it plays near a poisonous snake. On Zion, God's sacred hill, there will be nothing harmful or evil. The land will be as full of knowledge of the Lord as the seas are full of water. Hmm. And verse 10, a day is coming when the new king from the royal line of David will be a symbol to, to the nations. They will gather in his royal city and give him honor. A number of things there that are of interest we might talk about. It's interesting that it seems to imply that this marvelous new world is going to happen because of what? The earth will be as full of the knowledge of God as the waters of his, his oceans are full of water, right? So you're saying that that is telling you that there's going to be oceans there? No, I'm not necessarily saying that. I think there's going to be bodies of water. I don't think God has any reason to get rid of all bodies of water. But it seems to imply to me that it's the knowledge of... See, there will be no harmful... There, uh, on Zion's God's sacred hill, there will be nothing harmful or evil... And what's it going to be placed with? In other words, all sin, all harm, e all evil is going to be placed with what? A full knowledge of the Lord, as the seas are full of water. Yeah. So I think the key th to that whole section is there will be nothing harmful yeah. or evil. Yeah. Now, there's two ways that that could happen. Mm -hmm. uh, you, we kind of look at it as the animals are changing. You know, so they're not dangerous anymore. Or we could not be susceptible to whatever they had that made them dangerous. So there's two ways you can look at it. We're impervious to tooth marks or? Well, um, that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are not going to have bodies like we have now. Are the calves going to be impervious to the lion's teeth marks also? They're well, not might be. be might be well let's let's talk about something that we we don't have to guess about <laughs> yeah. I well I, I think we're guessing about a lot of stuff here okay I mean, on number seven uh, you know on question number seven and then number seven you've got night will be no more mm -hmm. is there some symbolism as with the sea being either the abyss or you know is there something with night because oh, yeah. to say night will be no more yeah you know we kind of went over that I, I know, I kind of like the nighttime, but, you know, I'm sure that I wouldn't like it if it was all the time, but I, I, I'm just wondering what the well, references we're, it's are. Well, we're going to go on. We're going we're to read in the next chapter. It's going to say there won't be any night because God will be the light. That's in verse 22 and 23. But yeah. night, night, like was a, night was kind of a time of danger, of the unknown, and... No wild animals for, come and attack you. Thieves. So it was okay, their thing. Okay, well, that's not I just only to clarify that. Not only that, but 
when you're in the dark, you stumble around. Mm -hmm. You don't see the light. You don't see anything. You, you, when, you don't have a clear view of everything. It's when the thieves take advantage of you. Yeah. Well, and, and let's, let's talk about something that we have mentioned in several places. What's it talking about dust will be the serpent's food? Does that make you remind you of anything? That's a fulfillment of prophecy. What prophecy? Genesis uh, three. Right after the yeah, um, that's right, fall. Genesis. <coughs> Genesis, Genesis 3, verse 14. Then the Lord said to the snake, You will be punished for this. You alone of all the animals must bear this curse from now on. You will crawl in your belly, and you will have to eat dust as long as you live. So, is this obviously, this, uh, this is intended to be a, a follow-up of that, right? So does this mean that serpents are going to continue to be with those forked tongues tasting the dust everywhere they go? Is that what you expect to see in heaven? Is that, what, is that what God is trying to tell us? I think it's more like what the good news says, the snakes will no longer be dangerous. Yes. Well, and who is the ultimate snake? The devil. The devil. Is it, do we know for sure that the devil will no longer be around? Okay, so there won't be the devil's behavior anymore, troubling us and tempting us and etc. In fact, we've already read that Satan's entire trinity is going to be what? Gone, thrown in the lake of fire. So um, look at Isaiah 65 verse 16 now. Anyone in the land who asks for a blessing will ask to be blessed by the faithful God. Whoever takes an oath will swear by the name of the faithful God. The troubles of the past will be gone and forgotten. So is we is the focus here on the troubles of the past will be gone and forgotten because we now are living with what a faithful God. Um, is God asking us to take a larger view here? Is He trying to say God has won the great controversy in the eyes of the entire universe? In the end, won't it be? God's faithfulness and his demonstration of the truth that will lead to the destruction of Satan? What, what is it that gives Satan continued ability to live on, etc., etc.? God's sustaining him. God's sustaining him. Why? So that all intelligent creatures can make choices. Okay. In other words, God is sustaining him because there's still people who question about or maybe believe his lies. And what will end his time of existence? No longer being sustained. When there's, well, and, and just prior to that, people will stop believing his lies, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. At least a fair percentage of them. Yeah. The ones who are obviously, everybody will have made up their mind. They'll either completely believe in him or they'll believe in God. And God says there's no reason to wait any longer. We just draw a line here. Everybody has chosen the side they want to be on. And what was Satan's first lie? God's a liar. God is a liar. His claim back there in, in the first, three, first five verses of Genesis 3. So it's absolutely essential that we recognize that God will win the great controversy not by the use of force, superior force, power, and, or wiping out his enemies, which he could do any time. I mean, if he wanted to do that, he should have done it a long time ago. Rather, it will be by revealing the truth. The serpent loses because he's a liar and the father of lies. Remember that? John 8, 44. Jesus, what Jesus said to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now look at Revelation 21, verse 2. We read it at the beginning. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready like a bride dressed to meet her husband. Is that? Yeah. How would you compare the first garden paradise with the renewed and restored paradise of God at the third coming? Surely the biggest single difference is that God will then move his headquarters, a new Jerusalem, to this earth. <coughs> but what, how do we, why do you think the first paradise was a garden and now the new paradise seems to be a city? There's more occupants. Hopefully. More occupants. Is it just things are crowded now? Instead of two, hopefully it'll be billions. Mm -hmm. Well, here's an interesting comment from Revelation 3, verse 12. 
I will make those who are victorious pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. There's the city mentioned. The new Jerusalem, which will come down out of heaven from my God, I will also write on them my new name. Well, is the city mentioned anywhere else? Where does that, maybe there's something in the Old Testament. Look at Isaiah 65, verses 18 and 19. Be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. The new Jerusalem I make will be full of joy and her people will be happy. I myself will be filled with joy because of Jerusalem and her people. There will be no weeping there, no calling for help. Doesn't that sound like Revelation 21? Right there. Well, we look at verses 3 to 7. I heard of, of this is Revelation 21 we're studying. I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne. Now God's home is with people. He will live with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and he will be their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. And going on with verse 5, Then the one who sits on the throne said, And now I make all things new. He also said to me, Write this because these words are true and can be trusted. Remember Isaiah? We're dealing with a faithful God, a God who can be trusted. And he said, it is done. I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. To anyone who is thirsty, I will give the right to drink from the spring of the water of life without paying for it. Those who win the victory will receive this from me. I will be their God and they will be my children. And of course, that reciprocity reminds us of John, the Gospel of John, doesn't it? And look at verse 8. This is the contrast. But cowards, traitors, perverts, and murderers, the immoral, those who practice magic, and those who worship idols, and all liars, the place for them is the lake, burning with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Do we now clearly understand what the second death represents? We're not sure. Doesn't it seem to... Go ahead. Where else is the second death mentioned besides here in Revelation? There are a couple places here in Revelation it's mentioned. Only in Revelation. Earlier, it's in chapter 2, and it's here in, at the end. The death, that, the death that there is no resurrection from. Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. Well, look at verses 9 and 10. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came to me and said, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Now, when you think of plagues, do you think of weddings? I hope not. The Spirit took control of me, and the angel carried me to the top of a very high mountain. He showed me Jerusalem, the holy city, coming down out of heaven from God. So now we're going to get a tour of the new Jerusalem from one of the bowl angels, one of the angels who poured out one of those bowls of destruction earlier. Why is that? Well, and he's giving us a tour of this Babylon, which... Peter seems to suggest as a symbol for Rome. So, how does it all fit together? Where are we going? Why were Adam and Eve given a garden and now we're going to be given a city? Some of us would like to have a little more space than just city living. Uh, how is that going to work out? Will we be con confined to a city for the rest of eternity? You know, it's kind of hard to think about this because... Mm -hmm. Well, We're running out of time. Hold your thought. <laughs> we'll be back right after the break. Don't go away.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. For those of you who might be interested, the handouts that we use in our uh, studies here in the book of Revelation will be available on our website. You'll see it on your screen there, theox, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. We suggested that Adam and Eve were given a garden. It must have been a gorgeous garden. But now, the lamb seems to be given a city as a bride, and that's where we're all going to live for the rest of eternity. Is that right? My wife doesn't want to live in a city. Okay. Well, it turns out that uh, the history of cities is not such a good one. Who's the first one to build a city? Cain. Cain. The first murderer. And if you follow down Genesis 11, you come along and... and What's going on? The, the builders of the Tower of Babel lived in a city. And if you go to Daniel 4, you find out Nebuchadnezzar, remember that proud guy that destroyed <clears throat> Jerusalem three times? He's wandering around there in that city that he's built, and isn't this marvelous Babylon that I have built? And what happened to him? He became he, a madman. Yeah, became, he went insane for a period of seven years. So, back to my question. If God made a garden back in the beginning, why is he make a, making a city now? Well, what I was going to ask, it's, you know, it's like what Jay talked about a little while ago. You read through Revelation, and you have a hard time drawing a line between what's literal and what's not literal. Mm -hmm. And so there's always that question in your mind. Mm -hmm. um, is the city real? Is it really real? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, a city it can be just made up of people. Well, just like a church is made we're, up We're going to find out that this city is cubic. Right. And, and the dimensions are so huge. 1,500 miles on each side. They are so huge that if you looked at it on the moon, it'll look like a round earth with a little d pair of dice on it, just a dice, piece of dice on it. It'll be that it'll be so high that it high that it is higher than what the shuttle even flies. Way higher. Way, yeah. way higher than that. Yeah. So, physically, I don't know if it's going to work exactly like that. Okay. Um, well, let's so. let's see if there's some other possibilities. Um, God apparently wants us all to live there with Him. And surely the biggest difference about this new city as compared to anything we've seen so far is the fact that God lives there. And Jesus, remember, promised us that he would go back and he's going to make dwelling places for us there. Um, we well, in, in remember, the, remember what Solomon said when he built his temple. Yeah. That God, the temple is just too small. The whole world couldn't even hold him. So you, if you're going to have him come and live with us, yeah. uh, you're going to have to deal with that reality too. Yes. 2,000 years ago he did. Well, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have totally rejected the idea that heaven will consist of people floating around on clouds playing harps. That would be a very different reality, right? One of the reasons we've done that is because Ellen White said these words, uh, 125 years ago, a fear of making the future inheritance seem too material has led many to spiritualize away the very truths which lead us to look upon it as our home. Christ assured his disciples that he went to prepare mansions for them in the Father's house. Those who accept the teachings of God's word will not be wholly ignorant concerning the heavenly abode. So she seems to imply that it's going to be a very real place. Well, I, I wasn't arguing that it wasn't going to be a real, pl real place. Mm -hmm. but when she talks about us be, not being scared of it being too material, you can go the other way around and make it too material, too. Yeah. So you got two extremes there. Mm -hmm. And when you get into Revelation, if you start making everything too material, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. But as far as the symbolic reasoning goes, it's fantastic. There's lots of things there. And it's really hard to draw the line to say what in here is going to predict what physically 
how physically things really are going to be. Well, I can guarantee you we're not going to be f playing harps and floating on clouds. Okay? I want to play a harp. Well, you can play that. I'm, you will well, play I a harp. It would be f fun to float on a cloud, too. It'd be, <laughs> you I can, mean, it couldn't but do that's it very not, long. That's not going to be, <laughs> be, gonna be the only thing you're going to do for the rest of eternity. Well, try to imagine yourself. Just think about this for a moment. What, will be, what would it be like to have God look at us and say, I have accomplished what I tried to accomplish. Welcome my bride. Well, let's think about some things. Read superficially, Revelation 20, verse 1. Let's look at that once again. This is chapter 20 now. Then I saw an angel come down from heaven, coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key of the abyss and a heavy chain. And then verse 2, I really need to go with it. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, that is the devil or Satan, and chained him up for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss, verse 3, and, uh, and see, um, locked it and sealed it so that he could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years was over. After that, he must be let loose for a little while. We've talked about that already. But is, is God going to forcefully bring the, the, the whole great controversy to an end? Well, we've suggested that Satan is bound at the end not by force from God's hand, but by circumstances. He's not welcome to go anywhere except this earth, and nobody's alive on this earth to tempt. There's nothing for him to do. So, let's look. Maybe we can get some clues from the Old Testament. Look, for example, at Ezekiel 40. I'm sorry. Verses uh, 1 through 3. It was the 10th day of the no new year, which was the 25th year after we had been taken into exile, and the 14th year of the, after Jerusalem was captured. This is Ezekiel 40, verses 1 to 3. On that day, I felt the powerful presence of the Lord, and he carried me away. In a vision, God took me to the land of Israel and put me on a high mountain. I saw in front of me a group of buildings that looked like a city. He took me closer, and I saw a man who shone like bronze. He was holding a linen tape measure, and a measuring rod was standing by a gateway. So what do you think is going to happen? He's going to measure it. He's going to measure it. And we come back to Revelation, what do we find? Here's a city that's shining with the glory of God. What does that imply? What does shining with the glory of God mean? Often when that was the, when that was the observation by humans, that meant that God was, in a very physical way, a very real tangible way, present. The people at the foot of Mount Sinai, when God came down on it, believed that what they saw on the top of that mountain was real. That wasn't an imagination. <laughs> well, through the, through the Bible, we see that, that the glory of God sometimes represents his character, his physical presence, as you, as you have suggested, even his power. And once again, we see precious stones mentioned. Uh, why is there so much emphasis on precious stones? We, we as Adventists have come out of a very, very conservative, traditional background where we think people aren't supposed to wear precious stones. Um, not very often, anyway. Uh, and why would that be? What, what's the point of that? And, and, and here we have all these precious stones in, in this new city. I have some friends that are over in Italy right now, mm -hmm. sending pictures back of the cathedrals and the mm. Duomos. And it's like nothing we have here in the United yeah. States. The, the different stones and colorings and the, they're, they're gorgeous. And mm -hmm. the gold. And the gold. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is what was normal. Yeah. Well, the reason yeah. people wear precious stones is to attract attention. Did the churches do that to attract attention? Well, I think the churches did it because they, 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 they wanted to have all the wealth. But would it be wrong for God to say, this is my bride, I want everybody to look at it, I want everyone to see it, I wanted everyone to be attracted by it? Maybe that's an appropriate use of attracting mechanism, huh? 
Well, look at these words from Ellen White to talk about how God's glory works. And this is a this is a puzzle. If you want if you want to struggle with a question about symbology versus real, listen to these two passages. These are both from the book Desire of Ages by Ellen White. First is page 600, paragraph 2. The glory of his countenance, which to the righteous is life, will be to the wicked a consuming fire. And Desire of Ages, page 107, paragraph 4. The light of the glory of God, which imparts life to the righteous, will slay the wicked. Now, is that symbolism or is that real? I think it's symbolism. Okay, how, does it, how is that symbolism? We're waiting. <laughs> how is it symbolism? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you don't think these people are going to really die? They're not going to really have life? They're going to really die, but she, remember she said like. Mm -hmm. It's like. That's what symbols are. Symbols are like something. But, but the challenge... Uh, there is not whether it's like this or like that. The question is, what, how is it that God's glory, which she doesn't say there's two kinds of glory, she just says God's glory, when it shines out, it affects some people by killing them and it affects other people by giving them eternal life. That's the question. The same well, what is the glory? The yes. what, what is glory? Is it light? Well, is we, it a heat? We, is it radioactive? Could be what all is those it? things. I know, but you got to. You have to. You have to tell me why it kills some people and it gives other people eternal life. That's I don't the know. Real question. I don't know of any fire that I've ever seen in a any kind of a laboratory that would kill people, some people, and not others. They that's, kill that's everybody the, the same. Depends on how close you so, get. So, so it is a fire, but but it's got to be some sort of symbolic fire yeah. that's doing that. Okay. As, as, or, Maya, as Maya recounted, the same su heat and sun that melts butter hardens clay. Yeah, that's and also yes, true. butter and clay so are not the same. They're different. But, but they're both. But you're talking on some more symbols again. Well, it's the person that makes a difference. That's what we're suggesting. It's, the, it's not the glory that's different. It's the people that are different. And what's different about them? Well, whatever it is, since you understand the symbol, when you see it happen, you will recognize it. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if you can get into your mind and imagine fire coming out and some people just yeah. standing there and other people getting what about burned the up. In the fir fiery furnace. What about that? Yeah. How do no? you explain that? Well, and it was heated seven times hotter. And the guards that threw them in. The guards that threw them in. Perished. So, um, so you're God protected. Ah, God, you God protected are, the worthies. You are um, by faith, hoping in God, and hopefully you're saved. But still, you won't run into a fire like that. Right now, there there was a similar fire when the children of Israel were in the desert and that glory would manifest itself in the temple and there must have been some sinners there and I don't think we have any recollection that well the good people lived when that moved into the into the t temple and the bad people died well so, the two oldest sons of Aaron died didn't they because they tried to take strange fire into the tabernacle well that that's true but that's that's not when the but there I mean, was times when nobody could go into the yeah into the um, temple. Well, we we won't we don't have we can't spend our whole time discussing <laughs> that. But that's a that's a that's a challenge. It's a, something for all of us to think about. Let's go now to verses 12 to 14. We're still in Revelation 21. This city had a great high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels in charge of the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of the people of Israel. And it's interesting to notice that Ezekiel also describes such a city and it gives the names exactly the names that are on each one of those gates <coughs> there are three gates on each side three on the north east three on the south three on the north three on the west the city's wall was built on 12 foundation stones on which were written the names of the 12 apostles of the lamb so here we have the 12 tribes represented in the gates and the 12 apostles represented in the foundations what is that trying to tell us about the foundations. 
It sounds almost like it's uh, it's very figurative of of uh, the group that is here. Their their foundation is based upon you know the work that the apostles did. I, I'm kind of stretching here to come up with something, but um, and the the twelve tribes. I don't know what's so special about them that they get their names <laughs> on these gates. Well, but let's say that this city clearly has connected to it gates and foundations, very important parts, clear reminders of Old Testament and New Testament. Yeah, but why would the New Testament be a foundation for the Old Testament? That's kind of a well, crazy, I mean, seems confusing thing there. Maybe their message was clearer than the Old Testament, a better foundation. Well, it doesn't say too much for the Old Testament. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, okay. Well, a foundation well, kind of keeps the thing solid, yeah. doesn't it? Well, the, the, the message of the Twelve Apostles was a solid message. Yeah. So there's all kinds of things you can get out of that. Yeah. But now, hold on a moment. We have a city that's cubic, 1,500 miles on a side. Why does it need gates? Yeah, where are you going to go outside? Where, where, yeah, where are the gates going to be? And why gates? What, do they protect you from something? We've read elsewhere that there's nothing harmful. Okay. Well, protect you. Why did you mention that? Ancient cities, that was why you had a wall and that's why you had a gate so that mm -hmm. you could be protected and the gates were closed at night, the time of when okay. terrorists yeah. <laughs> or thieves uh, thrived. It, or enemies. Isn't it going to be that sin will be no more? Okay. If sin will be no more, doesn't that kind of symbolize the thing that's going to keep it out well, for, the, for eternity? Gates are kind I mean, of, there's a lot of stuff that you can come up with. Gates are kind of pretty. It's pretty to go through a gate, so yeah. why does it have to be something that yeah. would keep out the bad? Maybe it's just because it's fun like to go in through gate. the pretty gate. Well, in John's day, and John's day and in Old Testament times, walls represented the difference between a village and a city. And those walls are there specifically to protect the people who are inside. I mean, villages you could just overrun. If you have a powerful military, you overrun them in no time at all. But a powerful military in those days, you come up with a, it, against a city that has good solid walls. And, you know, we're talking about sieges that last years to try to get. Is this a city that's going to be attacked eventually? Yes. Well, there's your reason. Well, but the question is, is, is a few gates going to keep Satan out? Are they figurative walls and figurative gates? Well, it's interesting that um, these foundations, let me talk about the foundations for a moment. We've been talking about the gates. Mm -hmm. How did fishermen and tax collectors and zealots end up being the foundation for the city of God? You know, though... They would, they would have been, well, I mean, what, look what the Sadducees and the Pharisees said about them. These are a bunch of nobodies, right? And they end up, these ultimate losers end up to be the ultimate winners, right? Well, in cities today, who do we celebrate? If you go to London, for example, or Paris or New York, we put up, sta we put up statues of what kind of people? The generals, the kings, the generals, the, the kings, the presidents, so forth, and generally for the, for all of the people that were around them, these people were not necessarily nice people. If you go to the London for the to the British Museum, there are walls full of that they have uh, uh, material that they have taken from the Middle East and put up on there in the British Museum of people like Sennacherib and Sargon, and they were definitely not nice people as far as the children of Israel were concerned. These are conquerors. These are enemies. So, what's going on? Let me read you the next couple of verses. The angel who spoke to me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was perfectly square as wide as it was long. Now, square cities are pretty common. They were common in the ancient days. The angel measured the city with his measuring rod. It was 1,500 miles or 2,400 kilometers. And in the, in the um, 
uh, measurements of those days, it was it was twelve thousand uh, uh, stadia. stadia, and it was as wide and as high as it was long. Wow. Why? What? What are the implications of a cubic city? Most holy place I mean, was cubic. Can't God take as much room as He wants to spread us out and give everybody plenty of room? Why do we need to live in a cubic city? Well, it, it stands for perfection and dimension. Okay. Uh, if it's the same height, the same length, the same width. Um, okay. Uh, well, it would be really significant if it was longer one way and shorter on the top. We'd probably be trying to understand why one would be longer than the other. Well, do we have any cubic spaces in the Old Testament that John might have been thinking about? The most holy place. The most holy place in the sanctuary was a perfect cube. As well as in Solomon's temple. And Solomon's temple, again, a perfect cube. So maybe what he's being implied by this is that we're going to live in a perfectly holy place. There's not going to be any sin. You people who want to go with symbolism, how about that one? Sure. And the 1,500 miles. You think there's really going to be 1,500 miles, this cube? What, what? Or is Jesus trying to say it's going to be enormous in size, just kind of like the how many times you're supposed to give, forgive your, your enemies or your brother? 70 times 7. That doesn't mean you can forgive him 491, 490 times, but you can't give him, forgive him 491 times. It just means a huge and normal, normal amount. But there's a very interesting passage in the Old Testament that would help us. It says in Zechariah 2, verse 1 through 5, In another vision I saw a man with a measuring line in his hand. Where are you going, I asked. To measure Jerusalem, he asked. He answered, to see how long and how wide it is. Now they knew how long and wide the old Jerusalem was, so this must be the new Jerusalem. Then I saw the angel who had been speaking to me step forward, and another angel came to meet him. The first one said to the other, run and tell that young man with a measuring line that there are going to be so many people and so much livestock in Jerusalem that it will be too big to have walls. What happened to the gates? The Lord has promised that he himself will be a wall of fire around the city to protect it and that he will live there in all his glory. Now what kind of a city do we have? You gotta act fast, we're running out of time. Well, this is a city that's unbelievable dimensions and its protection is God himself. And how is God gonna be there? He's gonna live there. This is gonna be his permanent home. So, is a wall of fire enough protection for you? What, what would we need protection from? He's just basically saying, we don't need protection. It's you'll just, be safe. It's, it, you'll be safe. Yeah. And when, if you tried to measure the size according to Zechariah, what was? It was impossible. Can't measure it. Well, many of our Christian friends have very different ideas about how all this comes about. And John repeatedly in his imagery, who delivers his messages to him? Angels. Angels. And many of our Christian friends have, have just dismissed basically the idea of angels. They don't believe him, even the devil exists. So what do you do? What happens to the book of Revelation if you throw out the devil and you throw out angels? You lose a lot, right? <clears throat> Maybe you agree with Martin Luther. Yeah. You wonder what in the world the whole, this book is all about, huh? Put that book at the back. We understand that book. Well, yeah. is it possible that there's something implied by this future home that could apply even to today? Are the 144,000 at the end of time going to be protected by a wall of fire? Well, look at the next couple of verses, 17 and 18. The angel also measured the wall, and it was 60 meters, or 72 yards, or 144 cubits, high according to the standard unit of measure which he was using. The wall was made of jasper, and the city itself was made of pure gold, as, excuse me, as clear as glass. So, what's a wall of 72 yards high going to do to protect a, a city that's 1,500 miles high? 
Now, we're running out of time, and let's just make it very clear, we're not trying to suggest that this is all unbelievable stuff. What we are trying to suggest is that there's probably things in this book, in these last two chapters, that we don't fully understand. So the 72 yards is 144 cubits, which yes. is the measure of 12 times 12, which is perfection. Yes. Or completeness, exactly. I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So why is God using human measurements here? Doesn't he have some better kind of measurements he could use? Well, it's interesting, if you go back to Genesis 2, God says to Adam, name these animals. Now, you think Adam was just sort of, oh, I guess that one will be a this, and a, you know, just... I'm guessing names, or is God trying to suggest that we are supposed to have the capacity to deal with and to understand and describe reality? You suppose those original names that the animals got described what they look like somehow or other? Well, people like Immanuel Kant and, and Plato way back believe that you know, you, humans can't really deal with reality. We don't even understand reality. The Bible says, oh yes, it's possible for human beings to understand reality. Well, as we're running out of time, the, the city will be full of gorgeous, precious stones, more than we can possibly... In fact, I'm sure they will be way beyond anything we have, can possibly imagine. Um, and we've mentioned that the gates will be made out of what? Pearl, single pearl. And then one more strange thing that I'd like you to think about, we're going to have to leave this question with you. If we read verses 22 and 23, it says, I did not see a temple in the city because its temple is the Lord God, Almighty and the Lamb. The city has no need of sun or the moon to shine on it because the glory of God shines on it and the Lamb, lamb is its lamp. Now that might explain why there's no more night, but um, what about that? No temple? I thought we are all talking about temple. Well, the same idea is suggested way back in the Old Testament, Isaiah 60, verse 19. But Ellen White talks about a temple that's outside the city in the New Jerusalem. And you can read that about that in, in her very first uh, message, her very first vision. And I'm going to have to leave you with that idea. Go and see for yourself.